So now I'm going to invite Israel to uh, come up onto the dais. And uh, just by way of introduction, I'm going to ask Israel three questions because um, I promised I'd stick to just three. In, I, I deliberately wrote it in the order of service so I wouldn't you know, go on too long. So just three questions, okay, Israel. And question one is, can you just share with us, describe for us your journey to this point of being the director of the One People Commission of the Evangelical Alliance? Great. Let me start again. So my name is Israel Oluwale Alofinjano, and I'm currently the director of One People Commission of the Evangelical Alliance. Um, and I was saying before that I'm a Baptist pastor, ordained and accredited Baptist pastor, and I've been doing that since 2007, but felt God was calling me uh, to help different churches across the nation. Uh, and so when the role of Evangelical Alliance came up, I felt God prompting me to did apply. And you know, you apply for those things, you're not sure what's gonna come out of it. And went through various interviews, three interviews. Uh, and then they said they wanted me. Uh, so I became the director of One People Commission. And I had to say goodbye uh, to a church, which I was, I've been leading for the past seven years in Southeast London. So I'm a Baptist pastor and I'm still a Baptist pastor, but not currently in a pastorate but working with the Evangelical Alliance. So that's just a little bit background about me. I'm married, uh, my wife's name is Lucy, and we have a son who is three years old. His name is Ian Olua, which means God's miracle in my language. Thank you. Hey, excellent. What's the vision of One People Commission? What's the goal? So I think if I can put it in three words, uh, or sort of three statements. Uh, the goal of One People Commission is to help different churches across the nation to work together towards unity, to see how we can work together, whether it's Asian churches or black majority churches, Latin American churches, to see how we can work together and model something of God's kingdom. So that's the first thing. The second thing is helping churches and organizations to develop to become multi-ethnic or multicultural churches or to go on that journey. So that could be transitioning to becoming one or could be starting something from scratch. So that's the second one. And then the last one is helping churches around issues of racial justice. So equipping churches through scriptures, empowering and whole life discipleship, helping people to just understand that when we talk about issues of justice, it's not political correctness, and I'll be explaining this more uh, in my talk this morning. But those are just sort of the three areas, uh, church unity, uh, multicultural churches, and racial justice. Okay, I'm, I am changing the questions ever so slightly now. Um, but this, you know, during the, the, the lockdown that we've had, and, and if I'm going to ask you a question now that impinges on what you're going to preach, just tell me to shut up, okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can take that. But um, the last 18 months, lockdown time, a lot of stuff has gone on to raise the issue of racial, racial justice. What do you think are the most important um, events that have happened during this last year, year and a half that have brought this issue to the fore? Thanks, Jim. I think there are several things that has happened that has led to where we are now. Obviously, the first one is the death of George Floyd, which has shocked the whole world. And in, towards the end of May, we had a one-year memorial, and there's still a lot of conversations around that. But I think beside that, there's also been uh, a panoramic, uh, you know, eye player sort of documentary that was about the Church of England, you know, exploring mm -hmm. whether the church is racist or not. I don't know whether many of you saw it. But again, that has been a shock to the system for those who have seen that program. If you haven't seen it, I think it's still on iPlayer. And I think there's also been a report from the Church of England uh, called From Lament to Action, which is a roadmap in terms of racial justice within the Church of England. So when you put some of these things together, it seems to me that God is beaming his light on issues of justice and asking us to refocus and to look at this again and again. And oftentimes when we want to maybe look away, think, oh, well, something, you know, this is gone. And then something else happens again, like the race report uh, came out just before the one year anniversary of George Floyd. And the race report is very controversial uh, in so many areas. Uh, and again, that raises the question, 
what is justice, what is racial justice, and why is it important? Why is it important to us as Christians? What can we do? What can we say? How should we speak? It raises those kind of questions, but those are some of the events that has happened in the last one year that Thank makes this conversation Thank you. interesting. I mean, that, that conversation has become really important. Um, I mean, to the extent that it, it prompted me to sort of seek help by inviting you uh, to, come and, to come and be with us. But give us one key thing that you think a church like ours can do as we try to look at you know, that, that issue, that problem of racial justice. What one key thing could we do that might make a difference? Or maybe there's more than one. Sure. But, you know. I think I'll be mentioning more, but I think one important thing that we can do is to begin to look at scriptures, discipleship, you know, as we meet in house groups to begin to look at questions around this issue and look at scripture. Because oftentimes when people hear issues around racial justice, people think that's politics. But is there something in scripture that speaks to this? And I think that's a starting point of a conversation. How do we enter into this conversation equipped with scripture, with a sound biblical theology of diversity that can help us to begin to navigate the nuances and the complexities of what is around us at the moment. I think that is very important as a starting point uh, because when we talk about justice, it's about discipleship. Uh, you know, it's about how we live our lives. It's about living for Jesus. Well, you know, it, it's about how we love the other, love your neighbor as yourself. That is what it's about ultimately. Mm. And I think scripture is a good way to begin to reflect and start this conversation. Excellent. Well, I won't steal, try to steal any more of your thunder. Thank you for answering those questions. Thanks. Um, and I think as we prepare to, uh, to hear from Israel, Richard is going to come and read um, some of that scripture to us. Thank you, Richard. And then Israel will be following on. The readings this morning are from Revelation. Uh, chapter 5, verses 9 to 10, and chapter 7, verses 9 to 10. Starting in Revelations 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language, people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Revelation 7, 9 and 10. And after this I looked... And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let's just pray. Precious Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you because this is the day that you have made. Father, we ask that you do speak to us powerfully by your spirit. Empower us. Father, we know that sometimes these conversations, they are not easy. But we thank God that we have scripture to be able to draw from. And so, Lord, as we reflect on scripture and the nature of your kingdom and trinity, Father, we do ask that you will speak to us powerfully. Let your name be glorified. And I pray that you will encourage hearts that are here today. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. It's very exciting for me to be here today. I uh, drove from London, 6.30 this morning. And I got here around 10 past 9. 
And uh, well, I've been looking forward to come here since Jim and I arranged it. When Jim explained what he was thinking, I was excited and I felt there's something we can do or we can help with as the Evangelical Alliance on this journey. And I think the approach I want to take is deliberate, and that is to look at scripture around this subject. Because as you know, explained in the interview, there are so many things that are happening. There are several conversations that are going on when you look at social media or media or the church or everywhere, there's several things happening. And there are words that are coming up that perhaps we haven't heard before or we are not accustomed to before. So people are now hearing words such as, or acronyms such as BLM, Black Lives Matter, or both lives matter if you live in Northern Ireland, depending. And when these terms comes up, they conjure something in people. At times it's like people are not sure what to make of it. Or there is CRT, critical race theory. And again, people are wondering, what is that? And some are not in agreement with that. Because there's a lot of talk about that's Marxist, and surely the church shouldn't be engaging in things like that. But what does the Bible say to us about diversity and about justice and about racial justice in particular? The scriptures that has been read to us gives us a glimpse of heaven. And here was John, a disciple of Jesus, after various persecution, after various uh, torture that is being through. One of the last surviving disciples of Jesus still standing. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He says that in Revelations chapter 1 verse 9. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So everything that we see in Revelation was something that was being revealed to John and he was writing them down to the various churches that he was sending them to. But what I find fascinating about the passages that we've just read is the fact that it was a heavenly hymn that they were singing, a heavenly liturgy. And the liturgy that they were using revolves around some purposes of God. Because he states very clearly, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men. And the Greek word there is actually humanity, mankind. You purchased humanity for God from where? From every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God forever. The four living creatures and the 24 elders, this is what they were singing as they were worshiping the lamb. So the lamb, that is Jesus, was the center of attention here. It was the center of focus, the worship. And there is the one that is on the throne, that is God the Father. But then the way the lamb was also described in some of the previous verses, it talks about the lamb having seven horns and seven eyes. You know, Revelation is full of symbolisms. And it, John explains that these seven horns and seven eyes, they are the spirit of God. So even here, we see a reflection of Trinity. The father, the one that sits on the throne. The lamb that is the center of worship. And then the spirit of God. And when we look at Trinity itself, it gives us a window and a picture of unity and diversity. Because one, God is one in essence. The Godhead is one. But yet, God is also three. The way we understand Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we cannot say, the Father manifested as the Son and as the Holy Spirit. The Father is distinct from the Son. The Son is distinct from the Holy Spirit. Three distinctive persons, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, but yet one in essence, 
unity in diversity. So the doctrine of Trinity actually models a framework, a theological framework for us around unity and diversity. In God's DNA is unity and diversity, which is no surprise that the church, the body of Christ, should express that. Because God's essence is unity in diversity. And we see that manifested a little here, even here. But the song they were singing explains the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the people of God, the community that has been redeemed, that has been saved. And it's interesting that the Bible didn't just use the word multitudes. I was thinking about that. The Bible could have, John could have just penned, I saw a great multitude, which we, he did mention in chapter 7. But he went to details to mention tribes, language, nation, and people. There's a reason for that. The reason is because God is a God of diversity. And God cares about our distinctive identity. Now, God created one human race. But that humanity is expressed with different skin color, different skin pigmentation, different physical features. Now, my wife is English, and when I look at our nose, it's very different. Our nose is pointed. Mine is a bit flat. That is the beauty of diversity. That is the way God wired us. That is the way God created us. God his creation expresses that. When we look at humanity and when we look at the entire biodiversity that God created, it's diverse. Why? Because there is beauty in diversity. God created it. And Paul puts it this way. He said God created one human race. Paul explains in Acts chapter 17 verse 16 to 26 there about. Paul talks about God created one humanity, but yet puts us in different geographic locations so that we can find him and seek him out. And so this is the idea that underpins God's kingdom. God's kingdom is multi-ethnic. Which is no surprise that the day the church started, the birth of the church, which you know, we call Pentecost, it's interesting that God chose a day that different people came to Jerusalem to worship. God didn't choose maybe a feast of Passover. He chose the feast of Pentecost when different people came. Different Jews who were born in the diaspora, who were born in the Greco-Roman world, they came to Jerusalem to worship. And as the various disciples started speaking in various languages. They said, we could hear people speaking in our language. Those from North Africa, those from different parts of Europe, different parts of Asia, they said, we could hear. And souls were saved on that day. So the birth of the church was steeped in diversity. Which is why, by the time you get to Acts chapter 6, the tension that we see in the church between Grecian Jews and Hebraic Jews was because, again, of that diversity. So, scriptures has a lot to teach us about this. And so, it's very important that we see it as God's kingdom. We see it as God's way of speaking to us. God instituted this idea, which means it's not political correctness. It is God's vision. And I think that's the first thing on this journey of developing a multi-ethnic church which flows or which can flow from that vision is this idea that it is not political correctness. It is not some left-wing politics. It is God's politics. It is not political correctness. It is kingdom correctness. And so this is very important. And so that's the first thing, recognizing that it is God's vision. That helps us to then go on this journey. Because if it's DNA, that is God himself expresses that. 
then the body of Christ expresses that. That's the first thing. Then the second thing on this journey is we have to be intentional. Intentional in our thinking, in our strategy, and in our action. Because oftentimes I come across a lot of churches, pastors, and they said, yes, we want to go on this journey. But people are not ready to be intentional. We have to be intentional. Now, we can pray about it, and I'm all out for prayers, but if all we do is just praying about it, it's not going to happen. Intentionality means that we are thinking about it, and we are ready to put certain things in place to make it happen. Let me use this example from Scripture. In Acts chapter 6, when they had that tension between the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews, you know, it was interesting that it was the Grecian Jews who complained and said, our widows felt marginalized. And so what did the disciples, the apostles, what did they do? They said, okay, select among you seven men of repute, full of the spirit, full of faith, who can carry out this task. Now, I find it fascinating that the seven people that they selected, all their names were Greeks. Check it. All the seven names were Greeks. Why? Because the people who felt marginalized were Grecian Jews. So even though they, were, they had a criteria full of the spirit, full of faith, they selected seven people who came from that background. Now that is intentionality. They didn't just come up randomly with people. They came with names of people who understand the Grecian culture. Stephen, Philip, the names are there. These are Greek names. It, that is how intentionality works. We put it into practice. For those of us who are married, anyone will know that the best way to keep a marriage going is intentionality. If you are not intentional, it's not going to survive long. You have to be intentional in your acts. You have to keep working at it. It's the same principle. We have to be intentional to put things into practice. Like, for example, what Jim did, asking me to come, that is intentionality. That is acting out. And so that's the second thing. We have to be intentional in our strategy. A third one is developing an integrated leadership team. Because for any church, for any organization, for any community, leadership is very key. Leadership is the gateway is the gatekeeper. And so integrated leadership means, is it possible to have a multi-ethnic leadership? Now, that question will vary depending on the geographic location of the church or organization. If a church is in a rural area where there's not much diversity, of course, it will be different. It will be difficult to replicate something like that. But if you live in a context and a church is in a context where there is some form of diversity. That is the demographics in the area or within the vicinity or within the region. How can that be replicated in our leadership? Because what I would do is this, it will help that journey to go further. But in some other cases, where that is not possible, it might be just inviting the occasional speaker like this to come, to come and speak about this and other issues, or having a guest worship leader who is from a different culture. Integrated, developing an integrated leadership team is very important because diversity will be seen from the front. And the next point follows on from that, which is visible representation of people of color. Now, you might be wondering, what do I mean by the term people of color? I'm talking about those of us that are Africans, African Caribbeans, Asians, Latin Americans in that context. Bain is a term that is no longer a term we want to, people to be using. And so a term that people are talking about now is people of color. It's not perfect. People are asking, so what should we be calling people? You know, you have to ask 
Some individuals like it, some don't like it, but there's an agreement that the term being black and minority ethnic, it's not right because it lumps a whole lot of people together in one space and it doesn't speak about their diversity because when you have actually talk about black, what do you mean? Africans, African Caribbeans. And even when you talk about Africa, which part? There are 55 countries in Africa. West Africa is different from East Africa. Central is different from Southern. In Asia, there are lots of countries, culture, customs, religious traditions. And so BAME is not accurate. But visible representation means how can we have people from those backgrounds involved in ministry that is visible in our churches, the preaching? Because there are times I've, I've been to other churches and yes, there is diversity in the congregation but most of those people are not involved in the leadership, shaping things or visible representation. They're not visibly there in that sense. A fifth point is something that we all have to do to learn more. How can we learn about the history of race and racism? We have to learn it. And the reason why it's important to learn it is so that you understand it. You understand some of the pains and you understand some of the journey. And so you have to do your own homework. You have to read. You have to learn it. And part of that also means learning a bit about British history. Because those histories, they are intertwined. Anyone who's going to learn this history is going to learn about empire, it's going to learn about navigation. It's going to learn about European explorers in other parts of the world. Christopher Columbus, Marco Polo. You have to learn about these things and the implication of some of their so-called discoveries on other people. It's important to learn that. And also part of that history is learning that slavery was not just abolished by William Wilberforce, that there were ex-slaves like the Nigerian, Olauda Ikwana, and the Ghanaian, Otoba Kogwana, who were part of the abolitionist movement. But oftentimes when we talk about abolition of slave trade, Wilberforce gets all the glory, whereas there were all these other slaves who were working with him. Learning that history helps us to put things into perspective. And then a sixth point is creating safe spaces in our churches to have this conversation. And I mentioned earlier, how can we have this conversation in our house groups, in our Bible study groups? Can we talk about it, looking at scripture, looking at history, looking at culture? Because it's part of discipleship, as I explained earlier. It's very, very important that we create safe spaces to have this conversation. And I use the word safe spaces, not just any space. That is... It should be a space where people should be able to express what they think. Everyone should be able to express what they think. So it should be a safe space, which simply means that those spaces, there has to be pastoral concerns as well because some things might emerge that needs pastoral care. And then lastly is, because this journey is not something we can do alone, we need other organizations and churches we need to collaborate with other churches. Maybe there's another church that is ahead. How can we work with them? Or maybe there is another church that is different from us. Maybe there is a black majority church or an Asian church. Can we do a joint service together? I know the pandemic makes it difficult to do all those things now. But those are the kind of experimentations that helps us to connect with the other, to go on a journey with other in that sense. These are important points that can help us to go on this journey. But it must start from that understanding that this is flowing from the heart of God, that this is God's vision. It's not PC. It's not left-wing politics. It's not Marxist. It's not communist. It's scripture because God's nature expresses it. The Trinitarian framework gives us that understanding. But also scripture from Genesis to Revelation. I don't have time. I can go through Genesis to Revelation and show you the implications of this. But I'm going to leave it there. 
Let's just pray as we finish. Father, we thank you because you're a wonderful God. Thank you because there is no one like you. Father, we find ourselves in a time and a season where at times it's difficult to have these conversations. But Lord, I believe that you are shining light on them so that we can have it because we have not had it for such a long time. But Lord, in our conversations, help us to be humble, help us to be generous with each other, Help us to be kind with each other, but also help us to be brave and courageous. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone that is here. I don't know what sphere they are. I don't know what their social media looks like. But I pray that as they begin to journey on this, as they begin to look at scripture, taking time to learn about this, that they will muster courage, perhaps to challenge some of the thoughts that they might come across in their own sphere of influence, to speak up and to stand out, to challenge, but also to listen where possible. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help us on this journey. Give us your grace, humility, and wisdom. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for listening, and God bless you.